Hello, everyone, and welcome to this pre-Yom Kippur special event, Let It Go. I know you're going to start singing some Disney song on me, but really, this time of year is a perfect time of year for letting go. That's what it's all about. It's about forgiveness. It's about letting go. Now, leading up to tonight's class, I asked you a question. And the question was, when you think of forgiveness, what is the first word that comes to mind? And the reason why I asked you that question is aside for the fact that I'm really interested in knowing, I also, so here it is on your screen. I will show it to everybody here so you can see it. The words that you'll see that are larger than the other words, it means more than one person or many people chose that exact word. So we have the largest word is letting go, literally letting go, or sorry, or peace, or love, or relief. And then around in our word cloud, we have so many other amazing words, brokenhearted, unencumbered, love that word, more mercy than they gave, accountability, forgetting, sins disappear, wrongdoing, blessing, repentance, teshuva, mending, acceptance, prayers, it's done, relief, redemption, caring, challenging grudge, wrongdoing, peacefulness, beginnings, apology, reverse, guilt. So take it in for a moment. Take it in for a moment. These are all words that people in this room associate with forgiveness. It's quite amazing, isn't it? So what we're going to do is, for the next, I would say, oh, Graham and Awana, hi. For the next 45 minutes, we are going to have a, I'm going to talk. And then I'm hoping that over the course of these 45 minutes, you will have developed a number of questions and thoughts and ideas. So the second half of tonight's class will be dedicated to your questions and your ideas. I'm gonna start by asking you to do one of the most difficult things I'm gonna ask you to do, maybe ever, but for sure tonight. Here in this room, you have papers and pens. If you don't have a paper or a pen, I want you to either on your screen, on your phone, in a note, it's just, just gonna be one or two words. I want you to write as big as you can a person who you need to forgive. Fold the paper and just hold it for the next 45 minutes or write it on your, write a note to yourself. I want you to write it down. So whether it's gonna be, yes, Michelle, people we, people, uh, someone, who not who needs to forgive you, someone who you need to forgive. Someone who you should forgive, but you haven't. Someone who you could forgive. It's between you and God. But I want you to have it down. Because what I want to do is take this class out of the theoretical and make it practical. And the way we're going to make it practical is by throughout this evening, as I'm talking, you're going to think of a particular person who fits this category of forgiveness. And we're going to see if it's possible over the course of the next 45 minutes to forgive them. Just, just, just a thought. I want to tell you a story a story that I've told a number of times before because it shocked me to my core. I was reading Simon Wiesenthal's autobiography. Simon Wiesenthal 
is the notorious Nazi hunter. He passed away just short of two years ago. And nestled in page 41 of his autobiography is a random story. A story that it's obvious to me he doesn't give much attention to. He just, it's one of those stories that he mentions in his autobiography. He says that it was right after the war, they were in a DP camp. They were waiting for the next move. Someone comes over to him and asks him to borrow what would be the equivalent of $10. He says, I have a package coming in from Canada. Next week, I will give you back the money. Simon says, I gave the man what was the equivalent of $10. The next week passed and there was no sign of him. Two weeks, three weeks, turned to three months, to 10 months. One day the, come, the guy comes running over to Simon and he says, I finally got my visa to go to Canada. Here's your $10 back. Simon looks him straight in the eyes and says, keep it. I'm not gonna let $10 change my opinion of you. Keep it. I'm not gonna let $10 change my opinion of you. I'd like you to write it in the chat box if you agree with Simon or not. This is a story that you resonate with. Is it a story that you agree with? Or isn't it? Well, I'll tell you my opinion. I'm sure there's some people here that agree. See, I see already people are giving the checks and saying they agree with Simon. I don't agree with him. I don't agree with him because I believe that everyone, no matter what they do, deserves an opportunity to be forgiven. Simon Wiesenthal was not a person who could forgive. Many Holocaust survivors were not people or are not people who can forgive. He actually made an entire career out of not forgiving. It just so happened to be that the grudge that he had is a grudge that most of the world had as well. And so he was given uh, acceptance and credence and, and, and lauded by the Western world for what he was doing, hunting Nazis. But really what it was is exactly an extreme version of this little story nestled on page 41 in his autobiography. He had a grudge and he lived his life with a grudge. Unless you can figure out a way to be Simon Wiesenthal, I'm not sure that's a good idea for a person to live. Not allowing a person to be able to be given another chance. I'm not gonna let $10 change my opinion of you. That's rough. That's hard. I know some people say that they think it's a brave thing to put yourself in someone else's shoes and try to understand where the person's coming from. I hear you on that. So a man once had too much to drink at a party. He makes a fool of himself and then he passes out. Friends helped his wife take him home. And the next day he was very remorseful. And he asked his wife to forgive him. She agreed to forgive and forget. And the incident was forgotten. As months went by, his wife referred to the incident 
from time to time, always with a little bit of ridicule, maybe a scorn in her voice. And finally, the man was fed up from being reminded of his bad behavior. And he said to her, I thought you were gonna forgive and forget. To which she says, I have forgiven and forgotten. I don't want you to forget that I have forgiven and forgotten. I think we've all been hurt. There's been a time in our lives that we've all been offended. We've all been betrayed, maybe mistreated. And it's natural for us to cling to our resentments. Actually, I think some people get a strange satisfaction from clinging to resentments. Maybe something happened to you when you were younger. Maybe someone wronged you. Maybe someone lied about you or, or, or cheated you. Maybe you had a good friend that betrayed you. And you probably have a good reason to be angry or bitter. But for your emotional and spiritual health, mental health has become such a strong conversation post-pandemic. For your mental health, I urge you tonight to choose to forgive. Forgiveness does not require, it does not require that you approve of someone's outrageous behavior. It doesn't require you to subject yourself to the hurt again. It just means letting go, a very popular word tonight, letting go of your resentment and anger. And if you attempt to bury the hurt in your heart, it's going to seep out and it's going to contaminate your character. It's going to contaminate your behavior, or maybe your life. So. In my opinion, true freedom begins when we can release the burden of our resentment. Harboring grudges poisons life in as much the same way that any other toxin does. A few decades ago, several American companies secretly buried toxic waste products underground. They filled these large metal containers with poisonous chemicals. They sealed the drums tightly and they buried these containers deep below the soil. And they thought this was the end of it. But many of the containers began to crack and leak and toxic waste started seeping to the surface. In some places where they had buried these containers, it killed off vegetation. It ruined the water supply. People had to move out of their homes. In one section near Niagara Falls, known as the Love Canal, many people began dying of debilitating diseases. What went wrong? I think it's a great metaphor, this story. They tried to bury something that was too toxic. They thought they could be rid of it once and for all, but they didn't realize that the materials were so powerful that they were in fact too toxic for the containers to hold. They never dreamed that one day these contaminants would resurface and kill people. Had they disposed of them properly, a terrible tragedy could have been averted. And I think the same is true with us. When someone hurts us, when someone does something wrong, instead of letting it go and trusting God to make it up for us, we bury it deep inside. We attempt to cram unforgiveness, resentment, maybe anger, in our what we're gonna call leak-proof containers. We seal those lids tightly and then we say, good, I'm not gonna have to deal with that. I'm rid of it once and for all. But just as the toxic waste tends to resurface, 
all these things that we've crammed into our subconscious, those things that we've buried deep in our hearts, they are going to rise to the surface and they're going to contaminate your life. We can't live with poison inside of us and not expect it to eventually do us harm. And I think it's a great point. Thank you, Andrea. The story speaks to inadvertent harm versus harm by someone abusive or toxic, where they know you and they harm you personally. I think it's a great point. Thank you. We could see this vividly in what I think is the saddest love story in the Bible. For those of you who know, I like to gossip Torah. I happen to enjoy gossiping. It's uh, one of my weaknesses. I have a couple weaknesses. I'm not sh ashamed of. I like wine. This is a nice Pinot Grigio for those of you who like to join me with it. L'chaim, L'chaim. And I like gossiping. And so years ago, I realized that if I'm going to have to change my nature and my behavior, I need to find something to replace it. You see, if you have a, a behavior you need to change, you can't destroy it. That's the mistake a lot of people make with, with changing behaviors, with diets, right? They're not going to eat it. Well, you know what happens when you don't eat it for a while? Then when you are back to eating it, you will binge it, and then you will gain all the weight back plus five pounds. So I know I have a desire for God. I enjoy a good piece of juicy gossip. So I said, what's the best way to be able to counteract my taiva, my temptation for God? So I'm going to gossip the Torah. <laughs> I'm going to gossip the Bible. So therefore, I'm able to enjoy the Torah for what it is. And there's a lot of gossip in it. Look, it's not a pretty story. And so... Today, and my kids always joke about it with me, that if you want to know like any family relations between anyone in the Torah or who did who or who slept with who, I will tell you everything. <laughs> so this is what I think is the saddest love story of the entire Torah. It's chapter six of the second book of Samuel. And it describes what should have been the happiest day in King David's life. I'll give you a picture of what's going on in the world of King David. He's united the northern and southern tribes of Israel into a single nation. It's the beginning of the ancient Jewish empire. He conquered Jerusalem. He made it Israel's capital for the first time. He set down stones that you and I can touch today. And as the centerpiece of his efforts, He's arranged to bring the Ark of the Covenant to its permanent home in Jerusalem with great celebration. Many years earlier, the Philistines had captured it, and now it's going to return to serve as the ultimate glorious symbol of the Jewish people's triumph. It would be a parade the likes on which anyone had ever seen. The procession with the ark includes singing and dancing, and King David enthusiastically joins the dancing with everyone else. King David's wife is Michal. She's the daughter of his predecessor, King Saul. She's watching from a palace window, and she's disgusted by the spectacle of her husband, the king, dancing wildly in the streets. And when he comes in exuberant, ecstatic, Michal greets him with a torrent of sarcasm. And she says to him, well, Mr. King of Israel, this is how she says it. I don't know if exactly the tone, and it's definitely not in English. Well, but you get the idea. She says, well, in a sarcastic way. Well, Mr. King of Israel, you're a real class act jumping in public like a peasant street dancer. The implication is, she's saying, I didn't grow up on a farm 
shooting coyotes with a slingshot like you. I grew up in the palace. I know something about how kings are supposed to behave. You are undignified. You, King David, are an embarrassment. Kings are supposed to act like kings. David is hurt by her disapproval. And it spoils the entire day of celebration. He strikes back at her where she is most vulnerable. By the way, it's an amazing lesson in relationships. Just digressing here for a moment. Couples get to know each other very well to the point where they can, what I call, fight dirty. And here you can see David and Michal, they're fighting dirty. Fighting dirty too much is the cause of no return. There's no way to get back from that. Because you can get him where it hurts. So he gets her back in her most vulnerable way. Saying, I was dancing before God. I'll explain to you why it's so vulnerable. But he's so hurt and he's so upset that he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, I was dancing before the God who rejected your father and made me the king in his place. You think you know about the palace? You think you know about kingship? Where is your dad now? And then the chapter ends with these poignant words. I'll tell them to you in Hebrew and I'll translate them right after if you don't know Hebrew. It says, Ulimichal bat Shaul lo hayala yeled ad yom mita. Michal, Saul's daughter, never had a child to the day she died. Meaning that David and Michal never again slept with each other after that argument. A flip comment leads to a permanent and bitter separation. I find this so sad. Here you have two people who once, they once loved each other so much that they risked their lives for each other. David would fight in these one-on-one -on -one battles with Philistines in order to win Michal's hand in marriage. And when Michal's father, who was afraid that David would usurp the throne, plotted to kill him, she put her life in jeopardy, helping David escape the hired assassins. These two people fought for one another. So what happened to that love? Was it in one argument? One set of angry words that destroyed it? That's it? It's that easy? Is love so fragile that one argument can destroy it? I don't think so. <clears throat> I believe, and this is my interpretation, and you can take it or leave it. As somebody who gossips Torah, this is what I believe. What destroyed their love was the fact that David and Michal woke up the next morning and they didn't forgive each other. They could have had a conversation and that conversation could have been infused with empathy it could have been infused with reconciliation. But instead, what happened was the resentment lingered and it contaminated the relationship. Resentment destroys love. Resentment destroys love. It destroys relationships. It spreads quietly and eventually it destroys life. And the Bible's point is as clear as today as it was thousands of years ago. If a husband or wife or two siblings or friends carry any type of resentment, if they don't forgive each other, the love cannot survive. No matter how deep your love once was, no matter how ingrained that love once was, it cannot survive. And so tonight,
I want to talk about the dance of forgiveness. The Hebrew word for forgiveness is the word mechila, M-E-C-H-I-L-A-H, mechila. We say it over and over again in our Yom Kippur prayers. It's related to the word macho. Do you know what macho means? To dance in a circle. You know the Jewish dance in a circle? That's called macho. What is the connection between a circle formed in dance and forgiveness? The same word, mechila and macho. What does dancing have to do with forgiveness? We are all part of a circle of life. The Jewish dance that stretches across history, a brilliant, a, a vivid choreography. When I remain angry at a member of my family or community, when I refuse to forgive you, I push you out of the circle of belonging. I push you away from the family. When you remain angry at me and refuse to forgive me, you push me out of the circle. We're no longer moving in unison. When we carry grudges, when we carry hate, when we carry negative energy, we can't dance. Think of it like the circulation in the body. The heart circulates the blood through the body thousands of times each day, transporting oxygen and nutrients that are they're vital for health. What happens when there's a clot? Heaven forbid. The blood is not allowed to dance through the body. God is the heart of the Jewish people. And every one of us is a limb. When I block you out, I create a clot. And the dance is diminished. The movement is compromised. Because everyone has a blessing to give. We lose our, our agility. We're forfeiting our grace, our energy. When I grant others forgiveness, we join in a dance of reconnection. When I let go of ill feelings, of, of anger, the obstacle to the flow of the circle is now removed and we can dance together in happiness. In a few days, once again, we're going to experience Yom Kippur. It's a reason why we're talking about this tonight. The day of forgiveness, the day of mechila. The most important thing that I can tell you leading up to that day is it's time to dance. To dance with each other, to dance with God. We need to have the courage to forgive the people who have hurt us. I asked you earlier to write that person down. Today is the day that we have to have the courage to forgive them. To forgive the spouse that did you wrong. To forgive the friend who betrayed you. And I know this is hard for a lot of people. And this is why I'm saying it. But to even forgive the parent who mistreated you when you were younger. This is the most amazing thing that we can do today to get rid of that poison. Look, we're not kids anymore. When you're a kid, it's one thing. But as adults, we get to decide the narrative of our lives. We get to decide what's important and what's not important in our lives. So my request to you is don't let the bitterness contaminate your life. And besides for the inspiration tonight, I wanna to give you five strategies to help you forgive. This is gonna be very practical, the next little piece here. If you want, you can pull out the notes for those of you who are on the chat. We usually have some people who, uh, 
who like to give us uh, some reviews. And also, yes, I, I see your questions coming in. We're going to get to the questions right after this piece. So continue asking your questions, and we're going to uh, cover some of these more difficult questions. But I think some of it's going to become clearer with these five steps. So for many of us, it's not easy to let go. It's not easy to let go of a grievance. It's not easy to forgive an offender. So the most popular question that I get around forgiveness is how? How do I forgive? How do I actually let go of hurt and anger? And so these are five strategies that I put together from mostly from my experience. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to uh, implement them. Number one, reflect on the troubled life of the person who offended you. Imagine your way into their experience, into their perspective. Consider their mental illness. There may be their psychological problems. Maybe the abuse that they may have experienced or the addiction they may suffer from. Somebody once said, hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. And ask yourself whether those factors might have contributed to the evil they did to you. Now, those factors don't exonerate their behavior, but thinking about them with empathy will make it easier for you to forgive them. <clears throat> Understanding can often be the catalyst for forgiveness. Perspective. That's number one, perspective. Know from where it comes. Even if you respect the person, even if they're a person of authority, know from where it comes. That's number one. Number two, consider the whole person rather than fixating on the bad behavior. Remember the kindnesses that they may have done for you. The kindnesses that they may have not done for you, but they may have done for others. Not just the mistakes they made. Two best friends once get into a fight. In the heat of the moment, one deeply insults the other. The one who received the insult said nothing. But the person wrote in the sand, today, my best friend hurt me terribly. Days later, the man who had been hurt was pinned under a fallen horse. His friend pulled him out and sped him to a doctor. This time the injured man carved in stone. Today, my best friend saved my life. I think that's the best way to handle an insult. Record it lightly. And then the, the winds of forgiveness will wash away the sand. The winds of forgiveness will erase it. But the kindnesses that we receive, we engrave them permanently. We recall them often. We focus on the whole person. And this is going to help you forgive them. Somehow, I'm not sure when this happened because it was probably before I was born, but somehow we were all trained to focus on the negative. That's the way we were raised. And I know that I'm asking for something very difficult, but in this number two, I'm saying that maybe not in everything, but to start looking at people as the whole person and focusing more on the positive they contribute than the negative they contribute. That's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking. That's a big ask. <laughs> Number three. Okay, we got one and two. Now three. Think about any unintended good that resulted from the wrong that was done to you. When others hurt us, it often pushes us to grow in ways we would have not otherwise. 
as hard as it, it is to see it sometimes, pain can be for the best. Obstacles can make us stronger. The defeats can prepare the way for future victories. So if you find it tough to forgive someone, especially someone who has asked you for forgiveness, see if you can find any personal growth or other good that was unintentional but did result from what had happened. And on the basis of that, whether it was purpose or not purposeful, you find it in your heart to forgive the person who hurts you. Your strength can be the basis for your forgiveness. As a young child, I really enjoyed writing. And I took my writing classes very seriously, even in elementary school. And I had a teacher in grade eight who just somehow, I wasn't a bad kid, just had it in for me. And she was my English teacher and she just had it in for me. And one day I just, in a fury in the middle of her class and I wasn't a bad kid, I said, you're gonna see next year, I'm gonna write my first book and I'm gonna bring you an autographed copy. <laughs> and she said, if you do that, I'll have a hundred dollar bill here waiting for you. <laughs> and I have to say it was a great motivator. <laughs> it was a great, great motivator. The following year, I walked into her class with an autographed copy of my first book. I just turned 15. She didn't give me the hundred bucks. <laughs> It's okay, I'm not, I'm not other people. I didn't hold it against her. But I can tell you, I wanted to prove her wrong. And, I, and that first book that I wrote, I, and, and I wrote in the book, this book is written to prove my teacher wrong. <laughs> so that hurt could, have been, could be a motivator. And that's up to you to use the hurt as motivation. So what we want to think about is any unintended or maybe even intended, like in my story, good that is a result of the wrong that someone does to us. If that becomes a motivator or allowing it to become a motivator for us to achieve and to do things that we never thought possible. Number four. This particular strategy will not work for atheists. It only works if you believe in God. If you don't believe in God, please skip number four. <laughs> no judgment, I'm just making a statement. When the person who hurt you asks for forgiveness and gives you confidence that they're not gonna repeat their bad behavior in the future, you should accept their apology and offer them wholehearted forgiveness. Why? Because people have the ability to change. People have the ability to improve and to grow. We don't stay the same. I'm going to make a statement here tonight. And I'm not saying it against atheists, but I believe that to ignore the possibility that people can change is the essence of atheism. Human beings are made in God's image. So to denigrate people and to deny their ability to change is to denigrate and deny God. So if you're an atheist, don't forgive, you're going to hell anyway. I'm just, joking, just joking. But if you're a believer, try to forgive because we owe the offender the opportunity to demonstrate that they are a different person today than they were yesterday or last month or last year. And it matters to God how we treat one another. 
because we all bear his image. I'm not the only one who bears God's image. Each one of us in the whole world bears God's image. We are all God's children. We're all precious. So by not forgiving you, I am denying God. And for the sake of Yom Kippur, that's coming up. God only forgives those who forgive others. If you want forgiveness from God for whatever you did this year, and you can state whatever it is, because we all got a little package of stuff that we've done, because we're human beings. If you want that forgiveness from God, then you have to be able to be giving that forgiveness to someone else. And if you don't give it, and you want to hold that grudge, then when God holds the grudge, you can't be upset. Because you're doing the same thing. Now, finally, the faith. This strategy, I would say, is morally courageous. It's not always applicable, but I'm going to share it with you because I love it. In the 11th century, there was a great scholar. His name was Rabbi Shmuel Hanagid. You may have heard this name before. If you haven't, a fascinating person to research. He was prime minister to the king of Spain. The king held him in high regard among the nobles, and many were jealous that the king had appointed a Jew to high office, and they kept trying to besmirch him. There's crazy stories about him because there weren't many Jews throughout history, especially in the Middle Ages, that were, that were held to great esteem. One day, the king goes with Shmuel on a tour of the city. As they're walking, a shopkeeper storms out of his store and starts shouting humiliating insults at Rabbi Shmuel. Rabbi Shmuel ignores the man, pays no attention to the nasty language. But the king was enraged. Remember, this is a barbaric age. So he said to Shmuel, arrest that man and cut out his vile tongue. Rabbi Shmuel inquired about the man, and he found out that he was impoverished. He couldn't support his family. And he decided that instead of hurting him or cutting out his vile tongue, to send him money. And he didn't send him money once, he sent him money many times. Sometime later, the king and Rabbi Shmuel were out in the city again, and they came across the same man who greeted Rabbi Shmuel, with lavish praise, didn't I tell you to have this man's tongue cut out? The king asked him. Shmuel smiles and he says, I did exactly as your majesty said. I removed his vile tongue and replaced it with a noble one. <laughs> I think this is a wonderful way to respond to those who hurt us, to help them. Help those who hurt us. Because in a very strange way, they're reaching out to us. Maybe, maybe in the only way they know how. Our resentment over the offender's sin will melt away when we replace it by love. I know this is a hard one, but maybe, just maybe, this is the only way. Maybe this is the only way that, that they can get help. And we're the chosen ones who they're reaching out to. So we have five strategies. Number one, reflect on the troubled life of the offender. Number two, focus not just on their evil, but on their kindness. Number three, 
consider the unintended or intended good that resulted. Number four, remember that the person has the ability to change. And finally, consider cutting out their vile tongue and replacing it with a noble one. Letting go of the hurts by helping the offender. I know how hard it is. I know it's very hard, but that's what God does for us. That's exactly what we want God to do for us. And that's what God does do for us. So why can't we do it for someone else? Forgive because schlepping resentments is like getting up every morning and filling an old wheelbarrow with old garbage and bringing them into a new day. Let it go. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you probably remember the southern gates to the old city. It's actually the one that's closest to the Western Wall. It's known today as the Lion's Gate. It used to have another name. It was called the Dung Gate or the Gate of Dirt, literally. And the reason for that name is for centuries, Jewish pilgrims came to Jerusalem from around the world to pray at the Kotel. They came on foot across the desert. And by the time they reached the gates of the city, their feet were covered in mud. They were covered in dirt. And they didn't want to defile the Temple Mount by entering the city in that condition. So they washed all the mud and the filth from their feet at that gate. So they called it the, the gate of dirt because it literally had piles of dirt from people's feet. I think today we stand at the gate leading to a new year. And I love the Jewish calendar because if you live your life in sync with the Jewish calendar, you start seeing so many different things at different times of the year. And this is the time that we want to clean the dirt. <clears throat> we want to go to the southern day, gate, the dung gate of our life, and get rid of all the dung. We want to enter the new year clean and pure. And so we ask God to forgive us for what we've done. And as a gift, we forgive others. And if it's not a gift, God looks at us and says, why should I forgive you when you don't forgive others? We ask God to wash off the resentments, to wash off the grudges, to wash off the lingering anger. And we know God can be angry. Remember, I'm a Torah gossiper. Remember the time when the Jewish people were dancing around a golden cow? God was very angry. What about the time that they were complaining about the fact that there was no meat in the desert when God took care of everything? God was very angry. I mean, and that's not, there were many other times. So the God that we know in the Torah could be very angry. And this is the God that we look at on Yom Kippur and ask for forgiveness. This is the God that we want to forgive us. The only way that we will be forgiven <clears throat> is if we have it in our hearts to forgive others. As hard as it is for us, as difficult as it is, we need to find somehow, some way of forgiving others. Now I'm going to take a look at all these questions. Can we forgive them metaphorically instead of physically? Can we forgive them metaphorically instead of physically? So there are three levels of forgiveness. One is um, forgiving them in your thoughts. 
The second is forgiving them in your words. And the third is forgiving them to their face. Mm -hmm. You may not get to the third. And that's okay. Which means if you think, because we know the people who have done us harm, if you think that that person will not be able to accept because of their immaturity, they won't be able to accept your forgiveness, then there's no point in opening up that kind of worms. You're almost missing, you don't want to open that kind of worms, but you still need to forgive them, even if they never know. But God knows, and it has to be a real forgiveness. And hopefully you can get to a point where you can also forgive them and they know. So I have a question too for my hands. Please. So I, I, came, here, I came here for a, for a real life scenario as well. Um, <clears throat> I have a very troubled um, sibling with uh, a horrible mental illness and personality disorders. And she hurts my elderly mother verbally and financially. And I try to forgive to release the poison and go to different groups and besides Hashem. And it works for a split second, but the minute I see the behavior again, because she was in my mother's personal space, I, I immediately go to the social worker and try to find, find and kick her out of the house legally. And I, I can forgive until the next behavior. And then, and then it's a so cycle. In my this, is, this is an interesting question. <clears throat> what if the person is constantly hurting somebody you love? How do you forgive that person? Not only forgive, how do you not let it affect your life? How do you not let it affect your life? Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold that question. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to some of these other questions, and I want to come back to it. And I'll tell you why in a second. Because we're going to deal with some other things here that are going to kind of start. It's like unpeeling the layers of the onion. We have here the serenity prayer. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else says, I think there's an element of acceptance in this or the possibility in all of this. I don't know if there's a way towards acceptance. Yeah. How do you remove people from taking up residence? You once said in another lecture, if you hold a grudge, you let someone rent free. Yeah, that's not my own words. Those are the words of Dear Abby, of Ann Landers. She said, she said, uh, holding, holding a grudge is like letting someone live rent free in your head. And that's really, really expensive real estate. That was my addition. Oh, somebody, somebody said that here. Look at that. Hanging on to resentment is like letting someone went through. We're all thinking the same thing. Fantastic. I'm happy I didn't say it then. Um, I understand that people can change when we forgive, but what do we do if they keep hurting us? Is there a way to forgive and keep our distance? Mm -hmm. See, this is a lot of the same questions. There's another famous expression in therapy, which is you can love someone, but not agree with their behavior. That's right. You can accept them for who they are, but not agree with their behavior. Absolutely. Yeah. If you have any other questions, I, I'm going very far up, but if you have any questions, just put them back into the, into the chat box so I can see them. So there's a couple of things here. And in, in, in kind of answering all of your questions together, I want to show you a couple of false beliefs. Um, holding a grudge does not hurt anyone else besides yourself. Nobody ever called me up in the middle of the night and said, please stop thinking about me. <laughs> So the only person that holding a grudge affects is you, number one. Number two, forgiving someone 
primarily benefits the forgiven party. Which means people believe that their thoughts hurt other people. There is a basis to this, actually. I'm not going to go into that tonight. <clears throat> but it's generally not true. It's mostly magical thinking. Really, forgiving will help you the most. And here is the third thing. Which is there's two parts of it. Number one is the you part, which is I am the author of my own life. I am the author of my own narrative. And the second part of that conversation is if I am going to be the one to enact the punishment on that person, then God's going to say the punishment's been done and God doesn't do what God does. So who do you want? You or God? Who do you think can do a better job? God. <laughs> I'll tell you a story, and it's, you know, it's many of you who have spent time with me know that this is my favorite story, my favorite Torah story. What is, what is my favorite Bible story? For those of you who have spent time with me, just write it in the Joseph. comments. Joseph. Joseph and his brothers. That's right. The story of Joseph. I know somebody knows me. There's a part of this, and I'm not going to go through the whole Joseph story because it's such a powerful story. And I believe it's the Joseph story. If there's one story in the Torah that you should know well. You should know that story because it is a metaphor for our lives in this world today. There are so many elements. So many elements of the Joseph story that, that play a, a direct role in our lives today. But what I want to focus on is the end of the Joseph story. So at the end of the book of Genesis, the last, the last verse is, and Joseph lived 110 years and he died and the brothers died. And that is the end of the book of Genesis. And then it goes to the slaves in Egypt. Boom. Push the slaves in Egypt. We don't know very much about the other brothers, but we know. Now, right before that line, and Joseph lived 110 years, let me tell you the story that happens. Does anyone offhand, can you think of in your head of what was that last story of Joseph before it said that he died? I'll tell you. Earlier on, Yaakov, Joseph's father, Jacob, was dying. And he makes Joseph, who's now the viceroy of Egypt, promise that he would not bury him in Egypt. There was a couple of reasons for it. Rashi talks about the reasons for it. It's because uh, he didn't want them to worship him as a deity. And also because he believed in the resurrection of the Mashiach and he wanted to be buried in the land of Israel. And he wanted to be buried with his parents and his wife and his grandparents were there also. And so he says to Joseph, make me one promise that when I die, you will bury me in the cave of the patriarchs in the Ma'arat HaMachpelah. And I picture in my mind, because this is, I'm very visual this way, when I think of stories, picture in my mind this beautiful image of the, the brothers, the 12 tribes, all carrying their father from Egypt all the way up to Canaan, to Hebron, and burying him there, the way that children should honor their parents at the end of their life. It's a beautiful image that I always think of. Like They probably took like his coffin and they had it on their shoulders kind of marching up the hill. This is my image in my mind. And I see this, this beautiful picture. There's a, there's a sunset on the picture. The, the, the sand is blowing and the waves and the, and the wind. They're not coming back from burying their father. And this is the story, the last story in the book of Genesis. The brothers start murmuring. Joseph, viceroy of Egypt. All these years, father was alive. He didn't want to touch us. But he's been harboring a grudge. He's been waiting for the moment that he can get back in us. And now father is dead. He's going to kill us. They send messengers. You understand this is assumption. 
pure assumption. They send messengers. This is not hearsay. This is in the Torah. They send messengers to check his temperature, to see how enraged he is, because they're sure that he's enraged. They come back and they say, no. So they go themselves. They bow and prostrate in front of him and say, we will be your slaves. Don't kill us. This is how much they are sure that he's harboring a grudge. Joseph looks at them and says what I believe are the most powerful words in the entire Torah. He says to them, am I instead of God? You intended to harm me. But God had another plan. He didn't deny. He didn't deny that they did something to him. What he said to them is, you are not the author of my life. And you are not instead of God. You intended to harm me. But you think all these years I've been holding it? I forgave you 20, 30, 40 years ago. Whenever it was, when I was 18 years old, I forgave you. Because you don't control my life. I control my life. You think I was sitting around talking about you? You think I, I care that much about you? No. You're not the author of my life. And I'll let God take care of this. Because you see what I did is I said, let God take care of it. And guess what? God took care of you. Look at me and look at you. So I gave it over to God. By not holding the grudge, look at what happened. Look at the rest of the story. And then the Torah continues, and Joseph lived 110 years, and the brothers lived, and that was the end of it. That is the entire, the end of Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. The end of the whole book of Genesis. This is it. That story, am I instead of God? It's the end of the entire story. That's how powerful this, this image is. That's how powerful it is when somebody can give up control and give it over to God. And God does not remain indebted the price will be paid Boy, so if you really 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 hate them and you really really want to get them back forgive them the best way to get them back is to forgive them that's what joseph teaches us Did I answer the question? You answered the question um, theoretically, but you put it in practice as well. L'chaim, put it in practice. <laughs> if the person is dead, you can still forgive them. And the way you forgive them, so you can go to their grave and forgive them. We don't have to have, even have to go to their grave. By the way, the reason that story you told two years in a row so powerful is because if that woman who had her son murdered could forgive that Okay, I'll tell that story too. Forgive that guy. I'll tell that story too. My favorite forgiveness story. <clears throat> My favorite forgiveness story. <laughs> My favorite forgiveness story is a story of Walter Rathenau. Walter Rathenau was a politician in Germany. He was the head of Germany's General Electric. He was probably third in command in Germany. Very good friend of Albert Einstein's. And in 1936, just two years before Hitler comes to power, Walter Rathenau is assassinated. There were three assassins. 
Two of them were killed by the police on the spot. And the third one was alive and caught. His name is Ernst Tekau. He's 21 years old. And he's sitting in prison awaiting his future. While he's in prison, he receives a letter from Walter Rathenau's mother. Just think about this a second. A guy just killed your son. He just killed your son while in prison, waiting his sentencing, you send him a letter. What would be written on that letter? You, explicit, 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 a grieving mother. What does she say? <clears throat> she says, I will forgive you. I will forgive you on two conditions. Number one, that you admit to your wrongdoings in the court of law and you suffer the consequences. And number two, that you admit to your wrongdoings in the court of heaven and suffer there also. In 1946, Ernst Tekau wrote a letter to Walter Rathenau's mother. Now, let me just tell you, she put her out. The only thing she had over this assassin is the fact that she held a grudge. She gave up the only thing she had over the guy who killed her only son. It could have been that that guy would have put the letter in the garbage. He could have burned the letter. She may have never known anything of this story. She puts her life out. And all that she has in her grieving moment to hold on to, she puts it all out on the table. But he could be a cold-hearted killer. He was a hired assassin. He is a cold-hearted killer. He could have not responded to her. Now back to the story. In 1946, he sends her the following letter. He says, the letter that you sent me while I was in prison is my most prized possession. As you know, I did admit to my wrongdoings and I suffered in prison. I got out of prison in 1944 and I joined the Foreign Legion. And for the last year of the war, I helped make fake passports and smuggle Jews into Marseille. Here are the list of names and the documents of 643 Jews that I helped smuggle into Marseille. I hope in some way what I have done will avenge for the blood that I shed of your son. By forgiving her son's assassin, she saved today who knows how many people. Then 643, but today could be families and generations. That's the power of forgiveness. And like Julian said, if we can do it, if she could do it, whatever little thing we have to forgive is nothing compared to what she had to forgive. A question, but it might have been similar to when I was asked. Second. First of all, Lachayim. If anyone has any questions, you're welcome to either put it in the chat or you at some point. Um, we'll see if we can unmute you as well. Yes. 
what's the line between forgiving someone and letting them continue to hurt you? Like if you say, you know what, I surrender, I forgive you, and the person receives it, but then they do it again and again and again to you directly. At what you, point do you- You don't have to be a doormat. So yeah. if you're forgiving someone, you don't have to be a doormat, which means you don't have to go back for more. Mm -hmm. Forgiving them doesn't mean that you're their friend. You right. probably will change the relationship forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that has nothing to do with forgiveness or not forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. Once something is done, you can't undo it. Mm -hmm. So there will be a change in the relationship. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you hold the grudge. Got it. So you don't have to go back for more. You don't have to become their friend again. You don't have to even necessarily ever really see them again. But in my situation, you have no choice. Because she, she's right. my mother, she's right. hurting my mother. Wow. Right. So in your so in certain situations, yeah. you have no choice. So in that situation, it's a more it's more delicate and it's more complicated. And you have to figure out a way to constantly forgive. Yeah. That's forgiveness that has to be given every day. Mm -hmm. Some people, Hashem gives them that plight of having to forgive people every single day. You know, there's a prayer that we say. It's a prayer that we say. I don't know if you know this prayer, but I want to show you. It's my favorite prayer, actually. I want to show you this prayer. So I'm using here this blue book, but it's, I'm sure it's in every sitter. Um, it's the first prayer. There's a Before we go to sleep at night, there's a prayer that we say that is called the Bedtime Shema. Now, some people just know the Bedtime Shema because when they're kids, they're Parents teach them the bedtime Shema. It's just like the Shema Yisrael prayer before you go to sleep. But there's actually an entire prayer that is said before going to sleep. It's the prayer before retiring at night. Is that after the Shema? No, this is before. This, this prayer is the opening prayer. Okay, There's the prayer before retiring at night. In my book here, it's on page 141 in this blue book here. I want to read it to you in English. We say this every, I say this every night, and every night I say this with a smile. I love it. My favorite prayer. Master of the universe, I hereby forgive anyone who has angered or vexed me or sinned against me, either physically or financially, against my honor or anything else that is mine, whether accidentally or intentionally, inadvertently or deliberately, by speech or by deed, in this incarnation or in any other, anyone, may no one be punished on my account. And then we continue. May it be your will, Lord my God and God of my fathers, that I shall sin no more, nor repeat my sins. Neither shall I anger you, nor do what is wrong in your eyes, the sins that I have committed erase in your abounding mercies, but not through suffering or severe illness. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable before you, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Say this every night. I could unpack this. I could give a class just on this prayer. I can give a series of classes on this prayer and why these words and how it's, I mean, there's so many elements that are covered here. But forgiveness is not just, I mean, we talk about it this time of year because it's so important going into Yom Kippur, but we say this every night. Mm -hmm. We don't go to sleep holding grudges. You see, that famous line that every parent, for some reason, tells their child before they get married, don't go to sleep angry, that's not really what they're saying. The real thing that parents should be telling their kids when they're starting off the relationships is don't go to sleep holding a grudge. Mm -hmm. That's a big difference. Because not always do you have the ability to work it out today. Don't go to sleep holding a grudge. Sorry, I couldn't help but think when you were mentioning that woman and that if she could forgive, like anyone should be able to forgive. It. And absolutely, and clearly, right? I couldn't help but think maybe she had a higher elevation. Why could someone do 50 push ups and then a person can only do 10? Maybe she had a greater ability. We can definitely look at all. 
we can look at all the, all stories and say, well, this person is greater than me. And well, Rabbi, of course you're doing this because you're greater than me. We're, we're all souls and we're all the children of God. Yeah, maybe it's true that some people are more athletic than others. But I look at my, my favorite athletes, the one that I grew up with in Chicago, Michael Jordan. And he was cut from his varsity team. And he said, the reason why he was the best is not because of his athletic ability. It's because he spent more time on the court than anyone else he knew. Because that's because the game of basketball mattered so much to him. And I think that if it matters to us, then we should spend more time on the court than anyone else we know. And maybe this woman spent more time on the court than anyone else she knew. So yeah, maybe she had the ability, but I believe that probably more than having that ability is that she worked really hard. Mm -hmm. You don't get that from nothing. That doesn't happen. You don't wake up one morning and say, I'm gonna forgive my son's killer. She was a person obviously who, who had practiced forgiveness. Maybe she said this prayer every night. And maybe that night, the night that her son died, heaven forbid anyone should have to go through this. She went to sleep and before she went to sleep, she said this prayer and she said, I have to forgive this guy. I can't go to sleep holding a grudge. Well, he should know about it. I'm gonna forgive him. And I'm gonna give him make conditions. And that's a fair statement. It was a fair statement, actually a noble statement, right? Again, this is our co commentary after the fact, but that's the reality. Any, any, I'm not sure, any guess that there was the second one forgiven heaven, that makes sense, but any reason her son was dead, why the, he must suffer in court? The well, no, because why do you think that those two things I mean, look, I'm just uh, I'm just speculating here, but I think that very often the court process is a is a strange one, and people can get by and get off even if they do a crime. So she said, you have to admit to your wrongdoing because admitting the issue, which means if we don't, if if you didn't write anything on a paper of a person that you need to forgive, there's nothing to talk about. This whole thing was theoretical. The moment you write a name on a paper this whole conversation tonight went from theoretical to practical. So she said, admit. If she knew if the guy was a cold-blooded killer, he couldn't admit it. So she was able to find the humanity in a cold-blooded killer by him saying, I did it, Your Honor. And he has to suffer the consequences of the court of law. And then she wanted to add another thing is then you have to then spend your time in jail and think about what you're going to do to make amends for it. And that's probably what he did. And so when he came out of jail, knowing the Holocaust was going on, knowing the war, it wasn't the secret. He read the papers in jail, they were getting the papers. He came out of jail and went right to work. And that's an amazing thing. In any case, uh, I'm going to stop the recording here, and then we'll uh, continue our conversation. Some people will have questions, so I'm just going to stop the recording here for now.